privilege tonight for the second portion of the program to introduce one of my colleagues and my wife's doctor and surgeon as well, and that's uh, Dr. Chris Allen. Chris is an associate professor of orthopedics and sports medicine. He practices mostly predominantly hand surgeon at Harborview, so we're able to share the care of many injured patients. Uh, but. Uh, Chris does an amazing job. My wife's very happy now that her trigger finger has been successfully released. He's, uh, he works here at the School of Medicine as well. He was also awarded uh, a uh, clinical scientist traveling fellowship by the uh, American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons to study cell biology and tissue engineering. So he's not only an excellent clinical surgeon, but he does a fair amount of research as well. He's presented papers at over 20 national meetings. He's a principal investigator, which means he's got to organize and write and coordinate the grants for two uh, major research projects. He's had 15 peer-reviewed articles and six book chapters that he's authored in his scholarly career. It's kind of a line eye night. I don't know any recovering Bears fans out there tonight. Uh, Chris also it was uh, born and raised in the Chicago area, went to school undergrad at the University of Illinois downstate, he says, and got his MD degree at Northwestern in Chicago. He did his orthopedic residency there at the University of Chicago, so he really got to sample all the great academic institutions that that city had to offer. He then really broke out uh, and, and went beyond the limits of Chicago and Illinois and went to Baylor where he did his hand and microvascular fellowship. So he trained five years as an orthopedic surgeon, then he did what, another two years, one three? Year. One year uh, to, do, to learn specifically just how to operate on the hand, particularly in, and with the hand, a lot of it's done under the microscope because the structures are so fine and so detailed. His research interests, again, are in wound repair and regeneration and tissue engineering how to make new tissues out of biological materials, and application of these fields to traumatic injury. And as such, he's been awarded a two-year grant from uh, DARPA, which is the U Department of Defense Advanced Research Projects and Agency. And they fund a lot of different robotic projects and everything, but it's mostly to look at restorative injury repair. How do, how do and other creatures uh, regenerate limbs, fingers, digits, etc and what kind of those types of biologic processes and technology may be applicable to human beings. He's uh, an active member at the, at the University of Washington Department of Orthopedics, which is actually one of the best uh, considered and most competitive orthopedic residencies in the entire country, and have really been pioneers in development of a lot of uh, treatment uh, uh, for orthopedic injuries and diseases. He's a husband and father, and you can see his family here. He's uh, an avid runner, and he does uh, marathon trail running. And here he is uh, showing his abilities as quite the mutter on the course. He's also a very accomplished musician. And believe it or not, one of the things we love to do in the operating room during mundane portions of operations is listen to music. It helps kind of soothe things. and, and uh, I'm, a, I'm very proud of my iPod and my music collection, but I'm, I'm told that mine is nowhere as well developed, particularly in acoustic music and bluegrass, is Chris Allen's. So he's an accomplished musician, and, and uh, he uh, has a, a musical group playing mostly acoustic and uh, bluegrass type music with fellow orthopedics. So it's really my pleasure to introduce a, a, a wonderful colleague and a great man, Dr. Chris Allen. Good grief. So I'm going to talk. Carpal tunnel syndrome is, is an interest of mine, but we'll talk about uh, 
carpal tunnel syndrome in the workplace and otherwise, and other occupational hand injuries, and the entire future of extremity surgery, blah, 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 and everything in the world. But then back to carpal tunnel. So carpal tunnel syndrome is, uh, by definition, it's compression of the median nerve in the carpal canal. And this is an interesting slide I borrowed from a colleague of mine. And that almost looks like a, a little glass uh, structure in there rather than the median nerve. But that's purported to be the median nerve. And the arrow is pointing at a, a region of compression. And so we'll talk about anatomy with these talks about conditions. It's good to think about anatomy. What does the, the structure look like when it's normal? The pathophysiology, what happens when things go awry, and then diagnoses and treatments. This is the median nerve. It comes from cervical root C5, 6, 7, 8, and it runs down the middle of the arm and underneath the cover of multiple muscles. Then we flip the hand up, and here's the carpal tunnel, the carpal canal. <laughs> carpal is Greek or Latin for wrist, and uh, bounded on three sides by bone, and the, the topmost surface, the volar surface, bounded by the transverse uh, carpal ligament. And we'll try and screen that for you right here. And the median nerve is right here. So it runs underneath this very stout fibrous band with the nine tendons that flex the fingers and thumb. And so there's not much space. And as we age or as we uh, either extend or bend the wrist, pressure on the nerve, preferentially on the nerve, can cause problems. The tendons are, are uh, much stronger structurally than is nerve tissue. And so we'll look at a couple of things that can happen. So thinking about the histopathology or things that go wrong at the tissue level, the blood nerve barrier breaks down and you get what's called endoneural edema. Edema is just uh, fluid filling up a space and it's fluid, not just water, but fluid with proteins deposited in it. Endoneural means within the nerve. And so this leads to connective tissue thickening as this stuff is sort of like jello in the liquid phase if jello exists anymore, I don't even know. But jello in the liquid phase, and then as it solidifies, you have this sort of this, uh, stuff that you can't move well through. And, and so that doesn't do well for the nerve. Localized fiber demyelination, the outer lining of the nerves is myelin that helps conduction. So if you lose the myelin layer, conduction is slowed. And then diffuse fiber demyelination, and finally axon degeneration, or death of the nerve. And you can see as you move from outer uh, circle to inner circle, what the symptoms in each stage of the histopathology of carpal tunnel might look like. So first, paresthesias or abnormal sensibility on an intermittent basis, and then this becomes constant, and eventually you have numbness and or atrophy or thinning out of the muscle. And the muscle innervated by the median nerve motor branch are the uh, muscles of the thenar or thumb region, with the exception of one of the deep ones, which gets a contribution from the ulnar nerve, and then some of the sensory testing we can do. And so the ways this shows up, uh, the, way, the reason that this happens is in part the nerve transmits substances which allow for nerve transmission uh, of electrical impulses as, for example, acetylcholine. These little vesicles spit out the acetylcholine at the synaptic cleft, and that comes from upstream in the nerve. So these substances are made in the cell body up here and then transported mechanically transported down the length of the nerve. And the nerve can be three feet long in some cases. So all these things are compressed. And so transmission, delivery of these, uh, the components of the synaptic vesicles is impaired with compression. And it's also the case that the bloodstream is very important. The blood supply of the nerve is very important. So the mechanical activity of secreting these uh, neurotransmitters requires oxygen, requires uh, that that be delivered via blood vessels. So if you compress the nerve, you compress the supply of oxygen. So for those two reasons, mechanical compression of actually the transport of components for nerve transmission and mechanical compression of the, nerve, of the vessels associated with the nerve, for those two reasons, compression of the nerve causes dysfunction of the nerve. So that's what we think might be going on in at least some cases of carpal tunnel syndrome. So who gets carpal tunnel syndrome? Probably because of the smaller size of the carpal canal, females predominate in a two to one ratio. Roughly one out of 250 uh, persons will develop carpal tunnel syndrome with a peak age at 50. I'm 51, so maybe I missed it. That's great. Workplace injuries and workplace exposures and workplace uh, abnormal posturing can lead to occupational disorders. So folks in manufacturing or construction or assembly work or food processing or with vibratory tool use uh, the pressure in the carpal tunnel goes up 15 times if you fully hyperextend the wrist or fully flex the wrist. So if you're reaching around behind 
oh, I don't know, something as you're an electrician or working with uh, uh, refrigeration units or something like that, you're at risk of carpal tunnel syndrome. Everybody talks about computer keyboard use, and that may be the, the most common population from which we see patients with complaints of carpal tunnel syndrome, but that despite every, many, many studies having been done, there's inadequate epidemiological evidence for a definitive association with uh, computer keyboard and mouse use and the condition of carpal tunnel syndrome. And yet I know that after a long bout, particularly with you know, poor ergonomics, which is sort of my, the way I do all typing, I'm always you know, one hand you know, on my little four-year-old and one hand trying to write a paper that was due two years ago. Um, <laughs> if you do things incorrectly long enough, they hurt. So I, I personally feel like it makes sense, but uh, if you go to the literature, as you should as a scientist, there isn't evidence for it. Many, many conditions are associated with carpal tunnel syndrome. And you can see, as you run through the list, that most of these are sort of packing disorders. So rheumatoid arthritis leads to synovial thickening, so the tendon linings uh, grow in size. And that carpal tunnel does not accommodate a change in size of those tendons. And the softest thing in there is the nerve, and it gets squished. Um, many of these other conditions, such as gout and amyloidosis, also result in, in overpacking in that space. Diabetes is a disorder which unfortunately leads to dysfunction in almost every major system, including the microcirculation. So the nerve's uh, vascular supply is impaired. And you can sort of run through the list and imagine how masses and aberrant muscles, et cetera, would cause problems. Uh, how does it show up? Numbness in the distribution of the median nerve, which is shown here in green. So the, the, the radial, this being the radial side, this being the radius bone, the radial three and a half digits most uh, involved and often nighttime symptoms are the, the beginning, and you get numbness and tingling. I get this from time to time. If it, we all tend to sleep in the fetal position, and so you mash things down, and if you do so long enough, you'll wake up with numb fingers. Another big one is to wake up with the ulnar one and a half digits numb from the ulnar nerve being stretched across the medial epicondyle of the elbow, as shown here in blue. Uh, and on examination, we try and get at that with first the history, which is more important and should precede the examination, but then asking questions uh, with examination, such as pressure on the carpal tunnel. So that would be right here in the palm of the hand, pressing. And uh, this was originally um, developed by a doctor named Durkan, who worked at, uh, in, in Hood River, where there are a lot of folks who apparently that's a big windsurfing area. And, and these guys and gals would be wrapping their wrists around their windsurfing boards and, and hyperflexing to, to ride these 40 mile an hour uh, waves. And they'd come in with carpal tunnel syndrome. And he developed this little device that exerted a, a constant amount of pressure onto the median nerve to try and reproduce their symptoms. And so now we don't actually use the device, but just press hard enough to blanch the capillaries in your thumb. And you know you're exceeding the closing pressure of the capillaries around the nerve. And then wait 15, 30 seconds and see if you reproduce the symptoms that the patient described. And so that's a fairly sensitive and specific test uh, for carpal tunnel syndrome. And uh, Tonell's and Phelan's sign, uh, Tonell's sign is tapping on the nerve, and that can stimulate uh, tingling or sort of electric shock feeling. And Phelan's sign is sort of reproduction of this business of hyperflexion or reverse Phelan's of hyperextension. Uh, the most commonly used test now is probably that median nerve compression test, which I just described, and then sensory motor loss. And that can be found out through a variety of examination tools with little monofilaments of, of graded diameter. And then also electric diagnostic studies with numbers that you shouldn't need to worry about. But it basically works like this. If you stimulate the nerve above the carpal tunnel and the transverse carpal ligament, and then a second electrode downstream receives the impulse, you can actually measure the latency of electrical transmission. And there are fairly well-defined rates at which a normal nerve conducts. And uh, something developed here by Dr. Robinson in our own PM&R uh, rehab department uh, is the combined sensory index. And so this involves comparing the median nerve, which does run through the carpal tunnel, with the same patient's ulnar nerve in the same hand, which doesn't run through the carpal tunnel. And so you get uh, sort of your own control group within the hand. And so he's found that this is a very sensitive and specific way to identify carpal tunnel syndrome. So what do you do if you have a patient with carpal tunnel syndrome? You start with the basics, which are uh, typing in a more ergonomically correct fashion than I do. And you can force uh, an individual to use the hand in a more normal fashion by realigning it with a splint and have them do so, particularly at night, it turns out, because again, we, we tend to hyperflex at night. Uh, for folks where that initial uh, conservative measure is unsuccessful, we offer an injection. And this is usually a combination of local anesthetic for immediate pain relief, uh, 
composited with, I use dexamethasone sodium phosphate. It's a steroid which uh, decreases inflammation. And it's an interesting fact that while only 10% of patients biopsied in one study showed an inflammatory uh, process going on in the tendons in the carpal tunnel, 90% of patients get better with an injection into the carpal tunnel for at least some period of time. A year out from the injection, 20% or so are still uh, experiencing a benefit from the injection, but 80% have had some recurrence. But it's a good uh, temporizing measure, and many people believe that it can be a predictor of how well somebody would do if surgery is indicated and performed. And we talk about no time loss, meaning that carpal tunnel, while unpleasant, isn't necessarily a reason to stop working, although job modification might be helpful, but it's a reason to, to seek treatment and institute treatment. If surgery comes to pass, uh, where and how is surgery done? So this is the carpal tunnel again, and this is the median nerve right here. And so whatever means, by whatever means it's done, surgery aims to divide the ligament safely, meaning dividing no nerves or vessels or tendons, and leave the nerve unfettered and free. And so that's uh, the zone where that would take place. And this can involve a fairly extensive incision. Uh, I use a smaller incision than this, but it's nice to be able to see all the structures and protect them. Uh, one of my partners uses an endoscopic carpal tunnel release so system, which involves about a, a half inch incision at the wrist, and then a device with a little um, camera, and a little blade that comes up and divides the ligament from below. All studies show that every type of surgery, as long as uh, complications aren't experienced, has a very high rate of success, and everybody gets back to work uh, at, uh, well, I should say that the difference between the two procedures is that folks with the endoscopic carpal tunnel release tend to return to work a little earlier, but um, the success of each procedure, open versus uh, endoscopic, uh, the success rates are about equivalent and quite high. So it's sort of patient preference, surgeon preference. And this is what you're aiming to do again is to release the ligament and leave the nerve and its motor branch uh, unaffected, and people do very well in general. Um, some facts you can tell your patients are that pinch strength recovers in about six weeks. The, carpal, the transverse carpal ligament does something. It was put there for a reason by somebody smarter than me. And uh, among the things that it does is it holds the tendons in place. And the tendons, of course, give you finger flexion and uh, can influence pinch. So taking that out actually allows the bony back of the carpal tunnel to collapse out a little bit. And so things get a little bit different than they used to be, and it takes a little bit of time to accommodate the changes. So pinch strength, six weeks. Grip strength may take as long as three months to recover. Uh, nevertheless, folks can do very well. It's a fairly minimal incision. No splinting in general after surgery, just a little dressing. So driving fairly early, writing within a week or two, typing within a month, and heavy lifting. You might want to wait for the grip strength to recover, but uh, six to eight weeks is a good number to think about. So carpal tunnel is bad. But if you think carpal tunnel is bad, you can take a look at some of the problems that we face. And in my practice, which is unusual since I'm based at the trauma center down at Harborview, these are the folks I see more commonly, really, than the carpal tunnel folks. Uh, this is a gentleman who was, uh, who was a calf roper and lost his thumb in the rope. This is a gentleman who works stamping carabiners for climbing and got the hand into the stamper and stamped the hand. And this, I think I'm cheating a bit. It's not actually an occupational injury. It was a driving injury. But for all I know, the driver uh, was on the job. Um, so try to stay with the theme. The World Health Organization, five or six years ago, pointed out that severe limb trauma, which can include any of these things, crush injuries, amputations, et cetera, occurs 67.7 uh, uh, times per 1,000 uh, persons in the US, represent 12% of all impairments from any cause, and therefore involve roughly 10 million persons in the US alone. So extremity trauma is a big deal. For those folks, uh, the pictures of whom I just showed you, we have precious little to offer that makes me completely convinced we're doing everything we possibly could. So I'm going to talk about what's available and some of the things that we're working on down the line. So repairs and replantation. This gentleman was on the job. He was working with a log splitter. I don't know what it looks like. I don't want to ever see one. But he, he took off all of his fingers. And uh, so 27 hours later, and some pizzas ordered in the OR, we had the fingers back on. The astute among you will see that the thumb actually died, and this has undergone a second procedure where we just lengthen the metacarpal. But uh, it does function better than no thumb, and these fingers certainly function better than no finger. But in point of fact, they don't bend very well. We can't, after doing microsurgery, let people start wiggling around. 
They have to be splinted for a while. And so these, uh, all of the small structures in the finger, there isn't really any extra tissue there. Everything matters and everything needs to glide smoothly with respect to the structures around it. So things stiffen up. So this is actually a stiff hand and the nerves do regenerate, but after age 10 or so, they don't really come back to uh, normal sensibility. So it's not a great hand. It's better than the day we met, but I myself would like to provide even more than that if we possibly could. If you can't uh, reattach the part, this is just not reattachable. You can't do that. The vessels are destroyed. Uh, if you got inflow, even at the wrist level, it would just bleed out through the central hole in the hand. So this is just a revision amputation. And to his tremendous credit, he went back to work uh, at the same job of record. There are a few workplace modifications and safety features, but I, you know, I don't know if I would have done that. So he's got my respect. But that's you know, not a surgical triumph. I mean, I, you can't kid yourself about that. So uh, in my opinion, we have an ongoing unmet need because our present treatments rare, rarely result in normal function. And so things to think about would be working sort of from easiest to hard. Surgical strategies to improve prosthesis use. This is going on all the time. I know that last year or your prior partner of mine, Doug Smith, came and talked to you guys about amputation surgery and um, prosthetic use. And he's working with collaborators in Chicago on taking the uh, stump side post-amputation and redirecting components of the nerve into, let's say that you have a, a, a transhumeral amputation, redirecting nerve components into the pectoralis muscle so that you can fire a shoulder-mounted prosthesis with, by volition, thinking about moving, say, biceps flexion or supination or something like that, and have individual motors actuating a myoelectric prosthesis. So that is definitely a next step that's uh, um, demonstrating already now in a couple of dozen, I think, patients uh, a markedly improved prosthesis use. And so that's an example of what can be done now to improve uh, function for folks with these severe injuries. Robotics is a coming thing. I think we've got a, we'll talk about transplantation in a minute. Uh, robotics is a coming thing. Obviously, if you think about a combination of the surgery that I just described, along with a, a much more sophisticated prosthesis, you might imagine something far better than the, the, the claw that we're familiar with from the old days. Tissue engineering, an interest of mine. Regeneration would be the ideal, but it's fairly difficult to imagine regenerating an entire limb from the glenohumeral joint on down, since it takes us 17 years you know, in development and maturation to come uh, up with the limb to begin with. And then as sort of a, a next step, in the research arena where I have an interest, what about a biocompatible or a sort of a smart prosthesis? Another option we haven't talked about is hand transplantation, and I think I have just one slide about it. This is already done. It's been done a couple of dozen times worldwide. So far, it requires lifelong immunosuppression, and sometimes the treatment is worth, worse than the disease. You can die from immunosuppression. Folks have done so status post kidney transplant, so it's going to happen eventually if enough hand transplantations are done. Some folks now are working on uh, sophisticated things like mixed chimerism and taking some of the uh, donor marrow uh, early on so that there can be acceptance of the transplanted part by the recipient. And uh, a group at the uh, University of Pittsburgh is working on uh, alterations in and diminution of the immunosuppressive regimen so that it's less toxic, maybe just one agent instead of the, the triple agent therapy that's used now. Uh, so this is, this is a coming thing, but not necessarily ready for prime time quite yet. This is an interesting strategy, not used here yet, but devised by Branemark in uh, Sweden, I want to say, uh, for amputees and uh, particularly used for lower extremity amputees. But uh, a two-stage process, implanting a socket and then sort of a, a snap-on replacement part that gives you proprioceptive feedback. So when you bang into something, you feel it through the residual limb and is much more solidly anchored than just a, a standard prosthesis, as in the case of this transhumeral amputation, uh, sorry, transfemoral amputation, with this gentleman with this little post here. But one of the problems that occurs whenever you have a foreign body implanted in the body is you get a response to it. So he's got chronic inflammation. Some folks end up with chronic drainage and then bone infection or osteomyelitis, requiring that you remove this thing. And then you've lost uh, not just the prosthesis, but more bone than you lost with the initial amputation. So again, an area uh, of some concern. Uh, very interesting idea, but maybe if we could come up with something that truly healed the host bone 
and truly healed a host's skin, we would be a step ahead. So that's an area where I have some interest. We talked about robotics briefly. Uh, we have here now Yoki Matsuoka, who's uh, formerly from Carnegie Mellon at their Neurobotics Laboratory and now doing excellent work here on uh, neural control of robotic devices and has a very sophisticated way for patterning hand use with robotic devices. DARPA, uh, looking at prostheses as a consequence of the recent events in the Middle East. And uh, the Utah Arm, which is now in its third generation, I think, goes back 25 or 30 years. Very sophisticated now with flexion, extension of the wrist, forearm supination and pronation. And uh, at least pinch with the thumb and index and middle finger. Uh, some progress being made. So who's this guy? This is the newt. The newt is, uh, to quote many authors, the, the champion of regeneration. The newt can regrow a limb, the newt can regrow an eye, can regrow part of a heart, uh, can regrow part of a jaw. Just the most amazing, amazing thing. It does so by sort of making a population of stem cells uh, at the injury site. So from left to right, uh, the amputation site, the cells actually go back in developmental time and de-differentiate, and they become stem cell-like. And it turns out that while the dermis, a component of the skin, comprises just a very small part of, say, a cross-section through the arm, dermal fibroblasts comprise 42% of the regenerate. So it looks like the fibroblast, which is a cell that kind of gets no respect, is just this dumb cell that's left over when the good cells are sort of washed away. It turns out the fibroblast can do remarkable things. And so we're interested in my lab and my collaborators' uh, labs and what the fibroblast may actually be doing to orchestrate the redevelopment or the regeneration of a limb. And uh, so this is a model of, of the, the newt regenerating a limb. And the question arises then, do we have such a capacity in the human organism, in any tissue? And it turns out that actually kids will regrow a pretty good fingertip after amputation if you leave it alone. So this is a patient of mine who was seven at the time that she stuck her finger in her brother's bicycle spoke and locked this off. And they came in quite distraught, as I now, as the parent of a four-year-old, I can understand. And I'd be, you know, come on, get this thing back on. So we ran off to the operating room in 77 minutes of tourniquet time. I still remember it. And uh, looking for the, there's two little digital vessels. And, and at the very end of the finger, they coalesce to one little terminal pulp artery. I'd never heard of any of this stuff. And I couldn't find anything. I couldn't sew it on. Who stuck it on is what we euphemistically call a biological dressing, which means we're going to let it just rot there like a scab. And uh, darned if it didn't do a very good job of regrowing a pretty good, not perfect, but a pretty good tip. So if you look back at the original amputation site, this thing's right off at where the nail begins. And now you've got the whole nail, and so a fair chunk of digit has regrown as well. So this is an interesting phenomenon to me, and I'd like to understand it better. So we've worked on models to try and do that, because if we can do this, even, let's say, not perfectly, but fairly well, what if we were able to figure out the mechanisms that allow this happen, and we could do so for a larger chunk of tissue lost in an older guy or gal. That would, be, uh, that would be a step forward, because we have those folks rolling into the ER every day, as you've seen. So uh, a collaborator of mine, Ken Munioka at Tulane, has done work with the mouse and has shown this is a little difficult to figure out, but this is a normal mouse digit tip, and this is such a tip amputated at about the level of the amputation you saw in that little girl at a week, and it's starting to regrow a tip, and at two weeks, you get more bone elongating the tip, and at three and four weeks, then you've got restoration of a fairly normal looking digit. But if you look really closely, you notice the eccrine glands present in the normal digit don't really regenerate. So it's sort of like in the human, it's pretty good. It's better than nothing. Uh, it's not perfect. And if you amputate proximal to, upstream of, the distal interphalangeal joint, the last joint, then you don't get a regenerate. You get a scar, a stump. And this is a clinical picture, if you can use the phrase in mouse mouse speak, of a, a normal digit and then an amputated pair of digits, one above and one below. And they, they grow a little shorter, a little curlier, uh, but they regrow. Whereas if you amputate proximally, they don't regrow at all. So this is a model that we can work with and help, uh, we think, help understand what happens in the human and see if we can tweak it, if we can stimulate even better regeneration in the mouse, can we translate that to the human? And uh, so Dr. Munioka has looked at molecular markers that are associated with the ability to regenerate. And it turns out that this transcription repressor, MSX1, seems to be associated with uh, the ability to regrow a digit tip after amputation. And what's suggested is that this keeps cells in a sort of a stem-like state in a little niche where they're available for use in the event of an amputation. It's also been shown, though, 
to promote de-differentiation in some organisms. And it's associated with regeneration in many regenerating organisms. So it's a fascinating sort of uh, first chink in the armor if you were going to think about something to look for in humans. Uh, in fascinating work by Shannon Oderberg at Utah, he's taken supposedly terminally differentiated mouse myotubes, which are multi-nucleate cells, and exposed them to MS61, and has shown that they undergo a process called cellularization, where they become mononuclear again and go back to being stem-like in nature and can be driven down different lineages to become bone and cartilage and fat. So, and that's a mammalian cell, so that's remarkable. So this is a mammalian cell that's beginning to function like those regenerating organisms that we've seen before, like the newt. So MS61 is a good target. So Zeltinger and Holbrook defined a serum-free medium for the culture of human fetal digits, and I came across this paper and I thought, well, this is an interesting area, raises ethical questions, but I see folks who raise clinical challenges. So this work has been extended by our lab and we've looked at MS61 expression in the human fetal digit, it's present. It's present in the same location as in the mouse, underneath the nail bed and past the nail fold. And we further found that with tip amputation in culture, first, the digit tip does regrow to some extent, which is remarkable. Since you're just growing in a dish, you don't have the systemic circulation. Second, we found that this MS61 transcription repressor is either uh, upregulated, meaning the cells at that amputation site begin to express it in greater quantities, or proliferation of cells that already expressed it results in more cells making, therefore, a larger quantity of this substance. Or finally, one possibility is that cells that express it upstream migrate to help rebuild the tip. And so this does look like an, a molecular marker of or component of uh, or candidate uh, for association with a process that looks quite like regeneration in the human. So it's tremendously exciting. And we're working now with uh, several groups, as discussed by Dr. Fo Foy, with this uh, funding we've suddenly uh, been fortunate enough to receive to see if we can parlay this into the ability to regenerate larger volumes of tissue lost in, uh, in the adult. And so the cells are interesting to us. Long story short, you can isolate them and culture them and show that they do express MX1 in a dish. Uh, so now we may be able to, to work with these cells and understand better how it is that they do what they do. And so things to think about are then, can you bring about, if you learn how these cells work, looking at the pathways that they follow as they reconstruct a digitip, can we then add those cytokines, those factors, to a wound, like some of the wounds that you saw, like that stamped off hand, and see if we can actually stimulate regeneration in situ at the wound site. Can you, as another possibility, find cells like that in the adult. We don't know yet. We're, we're funded now to start looking at that. We're going to track that down very soon. Uh, if there is a population of stem-like cells in the adult, can we then use the patient's own digit tip stem cells to help regenerate a digit tip uh, by delivering them to the wound site? Or finally, can you use them in a standard, more and more standard, uh, more and more becoming standard tissue engineering application to seed cells to a scaffold and then rebuild the part sort of in a dish, in an incubator, and then reattach as a, a, a different type of uh, transplantation using the patient's own tissues. So uh, we're working on all of these things. A colleague of mine, Dr. Zhang, in the material science area has uh, developed scaffolds that we've used on occasion, which involve a biocompatible material derived from crab shell called chitin, and uh, which, which uh, undergoing various chemical modifications is then called chitosan. And so we've looked at whether digit tip cells, digit tip cells will uh, bind to and migrate on chitosan. Uh, we've looked at the idea then, you can imagine, this is sort of speculative, but it's where we're, we're pointing our research efforts. Somebody like my calf roper, a uh, population of digit tip stem-like cells that can be culture expanded into numbers suitable for seeding to a scaffold of our choosing, something biocompatible, something the body will accept, not reject replace with its own cells, which then elaborate their own extracellular matrix, degrade this biocompatible scaffold. You can formulate these things. It's already been done as long as 10 years ago with uh, cow-derived uh, cartilage and bone cells on a fairly simple polyglycolic acid scaffold and uh, impl implanted into immunocompromised mice. Other researchers have shown you can tissue engineer skin 
and you can actually tissue engineer to stratified epithelium, which invites nerve ingrowth. So all of a sudden, you put all these things together, which has not yet been done, but there is no reason in today's day and age why it cannot be done. And you can really imagine taking this sort of snap-on digit and making something much more like a living digit from all these different uh, findings from all these different labs. But I must confess, my true love remains, my true interest remains the idea of regrowing the part instead of building it on the back bench and sticking it on. And you say, as I did earlier, the volume of tissue in an arm amputation is too great to expect it to regenerate. But my colleague, uh, Ken Munioka, who's down at Tulane, which is in Louisiana, which are near the bayous, sends me this picture of these uh, apparently adult alligators, one of whom is regrowing a pretty good-sized tail after amputation, which is about the size of my skinny little runner's arm. And uh, so it may not be beyond the pale to imagine that in the right circumstances with the right stimuli provided by us based on lab work that a number of people are working on, we could regrow arms. Uh, and then I'll bring us full circle and finish up with the idea that even something as simple as carpal tunnel may be looked at in a different way in 10 or 25 or 50 or 100 years. You could, we, could take, we could pull you on the way out and you could each come up with your own idea about what regeneration and tissue engineering and sort of the next phase of medicine might involve for carpal tunnel. I can't believe we'll still be taking a knife and cutting people open in 100 years. You could imagine gene therapy to deliver something that would boost the vascular supply to the nerve or strengthen the nerve against the compressive forces or loosen the transverse carpal ligament so that there was more space or any of a number of ideas that you guys could come up with. But I'll close by saying that uh, the future of medicine, I think, is going to be much more regenerative than uh, ablative. And so guys like Hugh and I are going to be looking for work, which is just fine. We have all that we can handle now, and we'd love to watch you guys, who are now the up-and-coming generation, take over and be smarter and do a better job. Uh, the future lies in our learning how to use the body's own innate capabilities, directed, stimulated, maximized, optimized, however you choose to say it, uh, as needed for specific conditions. And the fact is that our true regenerative limits are not known. And given a chance, rather than operating all the time, it turns out if you stick a skin graft on the tip of an amputated digit, it stops growing. So if we just leave things alone, things do quite well for themselves. So maybe as we get smarter, we learn to stop intervening so much and see what things are capable of on their own. So I didn't tell you my goal at the start, but I'll tell you my goal now. It's to recruit the next generation of physician scientists. And it turns out that a bunch of you guys are candidates for that, like it or not. Uh, and if I have the honor to do so, to train you in clinical and research skills and then come back here in a decade and hear you guys tell me what I didn't think about and how you're doing something that is so far beyond what I imagined that I just sit there in awe, which I, I know will happen. And at a minimum, for those of you who don't want to go that route, think about the things we've talked about. We all need your support. Uh, certainly research funding is always welcome, but the idea that you can talk to members of the community or politicians or just sort of have a heightened sense of what's possible and stay involved and be active because it is your community and the community of medicine uh, needs the support of the folks we are committed to serve. So we're actually all in this together. And uh, I say your votes. I mean your votes. So more info, ask questions, appointments, et cetera. Look for me on our department website. And I'll be happy to hear from any of you about anything at any time, including now. And thanks for your time. One thing we see in trauma patients who we are not able to completely close their abdomen and have to put skin grafts on them is we see them grow new bone. Where they had no bone at all in their abdomen, they'll grow pretty substantial bone, at least as large as a rib on the edge of where their skin graft meets their native abdominal wall. Can you just comment? on that process and if that has any potential? Yeah, so we were talking about this a little bit earlier. We see that in patients with head trauma as well. For some reason, that seems to change some metabolic pathway so that bone is formed. Heterotopic means in a location that's other than the usual location. And uh, we were talking again about bone morphogenic proteins, which are chemicals which can make bone form in muscle tissue and that sort of thing. But it may be uh, something to do with displacement of uh, the periosteum of the ribs adjacent to the injury site, often in extremity trauma, 
there's such an explosive injury to the bone that little particles are sent out into the muscle, and we think that acts as a, a nidus for or a, a source for some of this bone to form. I don't know that anybody yet understands what's going on in head trauma, but it seems to, the metabolic um, control of bone formation involves a calcium and phosphate metabolism, and it's tightly regulated, and I was just talking with a group yesterday about the dozen or so factors that can either upregulate or downregulate bone formation and resorption. So it wouldn't surprise me that there's some sort of uh, metabolic dysfunction due to head trauma that changes uh, the cell function in the region of the injury. And certainly just cutting in that area is going to cause those cells to be responsive in a way that they don't do when they're just sitting there uninjured. That's a long way of saying I really don't know. <laughs> but I'm fascinated. He told me about that. You know, I guess he was priming me to get ready, and that's as ready as I can be. But I really want to see the x-ray of the guy that he said one of these things grew back as big as a boomerang. So I'd be interested in seeing that. Being uh, one of the maladies that I see most in, in people I know, back pain, um, having to do with discs and things like that, is there a correlation here that someday some of these disc pains and back pains may Yeah, I don't do spine surgery. But if you're asking are there regenerative therapies in the works for back pain, oh yeah. Is that actually the question? Yeah. 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 Could, so could that's an amazing area. Yes. So folks are working on tissue engineering, uh, the nucleus pulposus, which is the central portion of the disc, and the annulus fibrosus, which is the hard fibrous outer coating that's thought to rupture as we age and squirt out the nucleus pulposus, which presses on the nerve root, which gives you sciatica or worse. And those things are being worked on now. Uh, there are already replacement discs available, and those are being looked at. Um, as an avenue for tissue engineering applications. Right now, it's often done, as you may or may not know, is you take the disc out and then fuse the two bones so that you no longer have the capacity for something to extrude and press on the nerve, but you also lose motion. And not every fusion actually unites. And surgery is not without the occasional complication. I know the spine surgeons will be stunned to hear me say that. Um, so yes, it's a very active area, and as we age, and every day as a 51-year-old chasing a 4-year-old, I understand aging better. Things uh, take longer to heal, and uh, our population is aging, as Dr. Kiefer said, so we're more likely to have all these problems. It's a very active area of research, probably more so than extremity trauma, unfortunately. Thank you.